believing it was worth it does not officially qualify as a delusion because when we're going when we're going to talk about realism all we can really do is talk about ontological realism you want to talk about moral realism that's a separate beast so technically even though we can disagree with them they can still be individuals of sound mind but at the same time believe that it was okay for them specifically so as long as their event chains like these consensual suffering event chains don't trigger or don't impact a non-consenting third party, and that is feasible in a lot of scenarios, then I say those event chains ought to have happened. As well, long as they don't impact the third party human or any wild animal. I know, I know, but this, this, this is where it gets complicated, right? Because I could argue that on the quantum level, there is no social contract. Okay, so all the contracts written in the social contract, the whole idea of murder and self-actualization and all your personal ambitions and all that crap all gets wiped out because there is this truth, okay, of value. So what I'm saying is, is that, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and that's true if we're going to say it, the premise is we're going to retain the social contract and say we have, we have some sort of obligatory obligation to have respect for each other's competence, but what I'm basically saying is, no, there's one truth. We can try to have some kind of compromise where we say, okay, we're going to split the difference, but we know we both lose then, right? The compromise means you've guaranteed a loss, all right? If, because if, if, if we're discussing ethics and practice, then yes, because we cannot foretell who will go on to regret having been born versus who will be okay with being born. So in practice, we are limited. But I like to, when I discuss ethics, I like to discuss them in principle. So I like to have a few crystal balls here and there where we actually are able to know the future. Because I think that's a lot more interesting and fruitful than being constrained by a lack of knowledge that we are in real life. So that would be my argument to that. And breaking it down to the absolute quanta, um, I don't know if that is necessarily... I do think it's everything is really interrelated with the social contract because the moment you say that you can do away with a social contract, you open up the door for the proprietarians and for the Randy and Nut Jobs who also think that the social contract is a barrier for their ultimate end goal. Right, right, which but, is but what I, but, but, absolute absolute selfishness. And right, right, right. But my argument, my argument to them would be that though I can prove them to be wrong. So I'm just saying that as long as I can maintain the credibility of my um, value standards, as long as I don't get a counter argument that it's a decisive kill, I can headshot their bullshit without the social contract. I don't need the social contract to exist to headshot their philosophy as crap. And as long as nobody headshots my philosophy as crap, Okay, I'm still got the upper hand, but I, I I'll concede the point that yes, as soon as we say it's wild west, it's wild west. But the bottom line is, is the truth is wild west. The truth is explicit in the end. The end, the end's going to be there's going to be a truth in the end, and either the ducks are going to be three feet tall or seven feet tall, but whatever. I mean, there's going to be a truth in the end, and if we compromise now. Compromise is essentially a guarantee of failure, is my only argument. It is sent, we know the truth isn't going to be the compromise. Whoa, you froze big time. There, you're back. Am I back? Okay. So basically what you are saying is that the only net product to strive towards is this sensorial net product, and any sort of optimization of ideological preferences is to be discounted on its face because you think that there is such a thing as a sound-minded person whoa what the hell happened I didn't do it it's not my fault it's not my fault it's anti-bullshit man's fault I know it is where the hell's my connection He's calling me back on the wrong Skype. How's he doing that?
<laughs> it's calling me on the wrong computer. Let me call you. Well, I didn't even do anything. I didn't either. I don't, I don't know what happened, but let me try to close Skype on this laptop. I don't know why it's still answering. And I'll call you back. Go ahead. I mean, it's closed, but it isn't closing. Should I close the call? I'll close it. All right. Are we back in business? Yeah, that was totally weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know where I got cut off, but I was basically pointing out that you are putting these constraints on the type of net product we're allowed to strive for, and it is only a sensorial net product, whereas I would like to invoke the optimization of ideologies, preferences, anything that you can be an, a, a, a fully grown adult can subscribe to who is of sound mind and who does not reject a single fact, a single concrete fact. It is possible for somebody to accept every single fact you and I accept about evolution, but still come away believing that their suffering was worth it. So unless you can point to me to a unless you can point me to a specific fact that they would have to reject in order to come away thinking that their life was worth it then I'm going to say that, no, the sensorial net product is not the only net product I'm allowed to strive for. Among animals, yes, I understand. Animals are strictly sensory. They can't consent to their own lifetime of risk, risk exposure. That's fine. Well, 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 again, I would probably can, can concede your point as, as just out of pragmatism, okay? I mean, just out of, like, if I could make the deal for everything that doesn't have that idiotic opinion, you know, and the trade-off would be as we let the crazy people fuck themselves, you know, literally, then I'd say, fine, you know, I'm not going to argue it, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be passionate to save somebody who doesn't want to be saved, damn it, I'm getting another error message, but, well, but I'm still there, I mean, I'm not going to have any passion for that, so I, I, that would certainly be something I was willing to be throw away for the, that would, I would willing to be a compromise. I, I think, I think there's a reason why you're willing to compromise it, though, right? Because it really does come down to preferences being a good in and of themselves, right? And 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 you said that they have to be dumb shits, or, or I forget exactly what you said a second ago, but do they really? I mean, realistically, I don't think that you think these conversations are just another pile of shit that life brings our way. I think there is something about these conversations where you can say separates it from horny, hungry, eagle type indulgences. Like my very last comment on the uh, on your response video on the psychology thing. Now I was talking about how when I have some generic rank and file optimist try to make chit chat with me, right? And then I hammer home to him all of his unexamined presuppositions or my co-workers when they try to tell me about how, you know, their kids and how the bonds are wonderful and this and that, and then I hammer home to them the cri criticisms of natalism and of parenthood and how I sort of slowly start seeing that even though they won't admit it in any sort of way to me, but I sort of start seeing them, seeing them get uncomfortable into the back of their mind. It seeps into them that, oh yeah, some of these arguments are pretty legit. Right now I get a psychological kick out of that, but... Is that kick I get just another hungry, horny, ego-type indulgence? I guess you can make an argument that it sort of borders on ego, but I think that is an intrinsic positive, and I don't see how somebody wanting to stick around to make that argument is necessarily a product of delusion, because that's why I'm sticking around, pretty much, to tell you the truth. It's because I get a kick out of these types of things, and I'm not deluded for it. Well, I'm not saying you're deluded for it. I, I, what I'm saying is, is I obviously have still, I'm still hungry, okay? I'm still horny. 
Okay, I still have incentives to keep playing the game because I'm, I have those psychologies, okay? I'm still addicted to the heroin, so to speak. The argument is, <clears throat> do you know, do you understand that that's what's doing it to you? That it's entirely built out of a hunger, okay? So that's what I'm arguing to you is that, yes, you do have an ego thing, Okay, and that's why you do enjoy it is because it's a stimulation of your competitive nature and you're basically out theorizing somebody or outsmarting somebody and that's fun to do. But if they initiate it, if they initiate it, should I be humbled by the fact that an ego plays maybe a minor role? Seeing as how they typically, I, I don't go out of my way trying to find people to pretty much argue the shit out of and make them feel stupid. No, no, no. It's when they initiate stuff to me. And it is because they have unexamined presuppositions that I sort of get... Right, no, but, but still <laughs> still a video game, okay? Or still like me doing um, computer programming, you know what I mean? Even though I don't even do it well, I enjoy doing it, okay? Because it's a challenge. We're competitive by nature. That's the ego thing I'm talking about. And we thrive off of that comp competition. So, I mean, I'm just saying that I understand that that's my psychology. And that's not much better than some old lady watching soap operas. Okay, because she's addicted to the drama. You know? Well, I think, I think in, in some respects it is. Um, and, and speaking of soap operas and, and drama... Um, I know a few months ago, you're going to get to this when you get to one of my later sections, if you keep reading. But I want to ask you now, seeing as how you brought it up. One of your tiny chat regulars pointed out that he actually wished he was asexual. And you responded to this with bewilderment because you said that you would really bail. Right Now, my, my point is that if you understand that you fully abandoning sports does not result in you missing sports in any way, why would you listen to this guy say, I forgot who exactly it was, but why would you react this way to him, seeing as how it's the exact same thing? You lose the passion for watching sports, you don't miss sports. He wants to lose the passion, the biological drive for sex, he won't miss it because it won't be there anymore. So why do you think that you would somehow be burdened by asexuality? It's not like I'd be burdened by it. What I'm basically saying is, is that the only thing that keeps me in the game okay, is that hunger. So without that last vestige of hunger, the delusion of my own, you know, my own love affair with my penis, I would be out of luck because then I'd have, I would have just a desert then. I'd have nothing to snack on. So the only, the only addiction I have left is sex. And I'm just saying you have to be addicted to something. There has to be something on here that you're playing for or you're going to be in really big trouble. So if the only thing I have that keeps me in the game is sex, I can't really imagine being asexual because I'm out of the game then. Stoics have nothing aside from brainy stuff, right? What do Stoics have? So it doesn't necessarily have to apply to everyone. And you, I think, project your own state onto everyone when you say that it's only hungry, horny ego. The existence of Stoics disproves that. Well, I'm saying that the honor codes and all that crap is ego. So I'm just sorry. I'm putting that in the ego category because that's like competition. It's like um, it's a I, you know it's elitism. It you know fits right into egoism. So I, I'm not buying the argument that the Stoic um, um, honor codes and and uh, striving to be. Um, um, I keep kind. I want to keep saying honor, but you know what I mean. I mean it's all caught up in a lot of honor code crap. And I'm just saying that that's, you know, doing doing things, you know, by but that. Ha but having never been a Stoic yourself, nor have I on any sort of full-time basis, I guess I'm a Stoic on part-time basis, but I fail because I get pissed off throughout the day due to a lot of factors, and I don't just keep it to myself. I rant and rail. But having never been Stoics on any sort of full-time basis, wouldn't that be conjecture to say that honor codes in their minds are just... <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that's not conjecture. That's my theory. So that's my hypothesis. Let's say, okay, I haven't proven it, but I'm pretty damn sure there's a psychology there. Okay, that's feeding them. All right, that that you can feed off of um, that in terms of having a, a, a self gratification in your own um, accomplishment of the task, playing the game correctly, okay, it's really playing a good game, and they play, you know, they put it just right, even if the ball doesn't go in the hole, it don't matter, they did it, they, I did a beautiful job of reading the instructions, 
you know. Okay, so shifting gears. So just as a practical fact, trying to convince humans to reproduce at a rate that's not sufficient to maintain human existence, wouldn't we first have to convince them that the animal issue would have to be eviscerated before we can go? Because if we go, right, it's just like any other planet. Suppose we found planet, but suppose we found life on another planet, just a, a planet that we can actually reach, let's say on the moon, right? So just how much would that impact the standard video you make? Would it change? Because I think it should change even though we don't have life on the moon just for the fact that the animal problem needs to be eviscerated, in my opinion, first and foremost. And humans, well, humanity, that's small potatoes. I don't care either way whether humanity lasts or not. Yeah, well, it's small potatoes in the, in the, in the mammal sense, okay, compared to the other mammals. But, I mean, mammals are, again, this whole, this whole thing of what life would be on another planet or how many steps you have to go through to even get to it, right? I mean... The the er thing, you know, with the whole idea that that only happened one time too. So you have abiogenesis, a one-time event. You have the cells consuming nu double nucleuses as a one-time event. Yeah, you know, how many of those one-time events do you have in this preposterous, you know, snake roll dice things that you're ever going to ever get to consciousness again? Right, going from chemical neurology to electrical neurology yeah. you know but I, I just use the example of a different planet because it's sort of applicable to the average in mendham video in the sense that you spend so much time emphasizing human <clears throat> right 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 well I, let, let, let's say i look at it this way if, if i was an alien and i just got here and i just showed up and i said i had to fix this problem right you would fix it by saying we'll take care of the most sensitive creatures in the most delicate way possible all right so eradicate them as as carefully and, and you know what I mean without you know you, you you want to be as careful as possible to do as few little harm so it'd be really nice if they went consensually right we, we could agree that oh yeah if we went consensually that makes it a lot easier so just stop reproducing right and if you could do that even with some of the mammals by making them sterile that would make it so much easier than doing some sort of I have to eradicate them thing and then obviously for everything else you could just blow it the fuck up okay well <coughs> Actually, the best way would be if you accept the equal opportunity indexing of suffering as you do, the best, the, the most optimal extinction is the immediate extinction. But that's going to be the section after the orphanage section, so I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that aside. Um, I still think that something I argued in section eight to great extent, which you, I don't want to say you glossed over, but you didn't, you didn't emphasize, is that I think sometimes maximizing or, or let's say minimizing delusion in and of itself even if it results in more harm like the broken clock is right twice a day type of thing right so let's say you convert let's say a religious some religious pedantic fucking snarky motherfucker walks up to us and tells us all about how deluded we are now let's say that we know ahead of time that should we make any counter arguments to him we're actually going to trigger doubt in his mind. But see, this doubt would actually cause him to be less productive than he would have been had his faith not been in shambles. Because we know actually a lot of religious people do. You might not want to admit this, but a lot of religious people really are charitable. So what happens when some smug religious prick walks up to us and gets in our face? Not, not necessarily in our face, but pretty much challenges us and calls us deluded. Is it unethical of us if we have knowledge of the future and if we know that our triggering a thought process in his head through our counter arguments actually causes that person to be less productive, should we just walk on eggshells? I'm saying no, we shouldn't walk on eggshells because it's not a strictly sensorial net product to strive towards. There are other virtues at stake, platonic virtues. So sometimes, even though we know that we might trigger some unproductivity in the future, not walking on eggshells and being a straight shooter with the adversary is the right thing to do because we want to maximize truth. Well, I sort of agree with that. And, you know, I'd like that to be the truth. But I'm just saying the, the place where that gets gnarly is, is that I'm not going to lose the Super Bowl for that. Okay, so if I got a chance to win the Super Bowl... And I have to win the Super Bowl by being a lying, conniving motherfucker who basically, you know, rapes and pillages. 
well, okay, I'm going to rape and pillage because the, 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 the end game is the game. So I got to win. You have to win. And yeah, you, you know, it depends, it depends just the amount. Like, I'll, I'll even say I use the cliche Nazi example lying to the Nazi to preserve the well being of the Jews. I don't know if you call if you recall that. See, now that's one of the few instances where I say lying is fair game because it's not a trivial harm, it's a non trivial harm because it's the Holocaust. So that's one of the things I dis I always make a distinction between trivial harm versus non trivial harm. So if the net product, if, if me being a liar is going to result in marginal net minimization, well, then I'm going to say no. But if the differential in harm is going to be extreme enough, okay, I'll do the lying if my lying is going to prevent the extreme enough suffering. So to me, that in and, in and of itself shows how arbitrary it is, because if it's only a marginal difference, then... Well, yeah, I'm not going to be willing to turn myself into a liar because I want to be able to live with myself. And I think this is one of the reasons why you have not, as of yet, despite, look, we both know that there is a formula to becoming a YouTube success, right? We know that you can't just focus on any one area. You have to do a bunch of things. You have to do sex talk. You have to do apolitical current events. You have to do fancy editing. You have to do the green screen. You have to be a cheerful motherfucker. You have to be... Um, in a lot of respects, a used car salesman in your personality. And even though we know we can spread our message more effectively by succumbing to all those tactics, we refuse to do so because at the end of the day, we value being at ease with ourselves, knowing what we contributed to the Internet and the style in which we contributed it in. Well, that's partially true, but I mean, quite obviously, I have to some extent attempted to moderate my persona, right? I did the good news, right? The good news was sort of a moderate me. You enjoy <laughs> doing the good news. Don't tell me you didn't. No, I, I, I did. Yeah, I did. Exactly. I liked, I liked having a little bit of fun instead of always doing this dark shit. I was able to do something a little more. Uh, Everything. You enjoyed reading Dickens that one time. You enjoyed Ed. You enjoy every entertaining thing you did. Hanging upside down. All of that was enjoyable. But what you won't do is you won't do the green screen thing. You won't have a little bubblegum, teeny poppy tune playing in the back of your videos. The stuff that really sells. Right? Well, I'm certainly not going to put the word subscribe on the screen. Yeah, okay, I'm certainly not going to do these stupid asshole things, right, because those things are just so offensive to my personal integrity. So okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you that there's a line I would draw, but I'm just saying if I could get a million views, I would sell out. You know, just because obviously I have to, I mean, I really have to win, and I'm not going to win from this back alley. So there is a point where I'm going to have to compromise my soul. I'm going to have to sell my soul to the devil or do whatever I have to do. Because in the end, i got to win. But even, even with a million views, I mean, it's still a drop in the bucket. Well, I'm just saying, if I, <laughs> the, the bucket, I'm, I, I guess I would argue that once the bucket gets big enough and you get this as a as something that actually happens in pop culture media you know where they actually have to deal with it as an issue i don't think they're going to be able to deal with it i think it's going to win because i don't i think the counter arguments are going to be so vacuous and so empty that it's going to be like cosmos or something else it's going to it's going to all of a sudden everybody's going to be turned upside down and saying why weren't there shows like this on 20 years ago but you're ignoring just how incredulous people can be, especially when it comes to even the simple truth of evolution. I mean, it would, it took decade after decade after decade in the U.S. alone, I mean, a developed first world superpower. For, and, and to this day, look, 40 some odd percent of Americans don't believe in evolution. 40 some odd percent of Americans. So people can be endlessly incredulous because narratives shape their view and confirmation bias shapes their view so they can avoid even if you become popular they can avoid you if they don't like what you're saying so unless you can get some sort of hands-on policy merely uh, again first step creationism still held by 40 some odd percent of america well, i'm just saying that i think all of those subjects are also underrepresented in the debates that go on so i'm just saying you know that's barely a subject that's even gotten touched upon and once it gets touched upon i think the whole atheism theism debate once that gets into the 
arena of real commentary and real, you know what I mean? Because it really is done from some sort of pompous, you know, uh, oh, this is a silly atheist. This is a silly atheist. And that's not going to work too much longer. That silly atheist crap ain't going to fly too much longer. That's not... No, a lot of indie media and maybe even some mainstream media outlets do not treat atheists in the way they treated atheists a few decades ago. Whereas procreation, right? I can't even think of a single media outlet, whether it's mainstream or whether it's indie, treating the subject of procreation as a contentious issue. I'm not even saying they have to align with us. I'm just saying they don't even ignore... Well, I know, but look at the stuff that's on our side, okay? Every civilized country, the most educated people, are under-reproducing. So statistically, we have this huge statistical fact that most people are antinatalist in behavior. They're choosing deliberately to have insufficient children to maintain human population. See, this is, this is where I'm going to take you to task in the section on extinction, because the maximal aim of antinatalism does not have to be one of extinction in the first place. It can be, as I argue, one of the main reasons I'm an antinatalist is firstly my contempt, my utter unmitigated contempt of parenthood and of familialism. Right now, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with that now because you're going to get to read that. Should you choose to read section E, um, but that's my two big issues, right? Whereas you would probably view those as you know second fiddle, and the first is the maximal aim of extinction. I view extinction as a byproduct, as a lethargic byproduct. If it happens, okay. If people want to take immortality pills, okay too. At least they're taking immortality pills with their own welfare. Well, I mean, if it was their own welfare without the biosphere being a, a, a slave to it. So I'm not going to let them drag the slaved biosphere into their immortal future. So, so is, this, is, this, is this the every breath you take argument? Well, I mean, that's certainly, an, I don't see what's wrong with that argument. Just because you understand oxygen precedes sentience, right? Well, I certainly understand that it precedes sentience, but it doesn't precede the existence of life. And it doesn't really matter because the thing keeping the oxygen ratio in balance are the other organisms. So they have to exist. You have to make a viral argument because it's trees. So are you worried about trees now? I mean, what? Well, I'm, no, I'm not. I do, are trees not completely interwoven into uh, mammals providing the nutrients and um, um, uh, fertilizer for their maintenance and growth? I mean, uh, you go to a volcanic island and you're not going to see too many trees growing. So obviously soil um, is a huge factor in trees being able to grow. So I'm just saying you're not going to be able to um, have your biosphere, okay, uh, without the large mammals. But, but, but I, I still don't see how that argument leads to anywhere else but believing that it is actually sentience that precedes the oxygen. I, I still don't see how. Right? Why well, I don't understand what? Who cares about who? What preceded what? I'm talking about our dependency on a biology that has a parasitic symbiotic relationships that have been created over billions of years that we have to unravel before we have a right to go into a future. So if you're going to go into a forever future, you have to first figure out a way to get the other passengers off the plane you plan on crashing and burning. So if you want to crash and burn, go ahead, but don't take any large mammals with you. Okay, don't take any large sentience with you, okay? You want to take trees oh. with you, okay, but you can't take sentience with you. Well, you know I'm on board with that, but I'm just saying, again, in practice or ethics in principle. I'd rather discuss them in principle because I don't want to be restricted by a bunch of catch-22s or lacks of, lack of knowledge. So it, it is feasible to imagine how the immortality thing might work without the domino effect, third party, non-consenting party being affected. So as long as it's feasible, I think it's worth just throwing it out there for people to let us know, to, to let people know that we would not have a problem with it as long as it doesn't implicate others, despite the fact that they would suffer all the same. So once again, it, it does, it is, it is very, I'm very hostile to the equal opportunity indexing of suffering, because the moment you make it equal, regardless of who the person suffering is, then it doesn't matter what the person believes, 
It's about the sensorial state. And I just sort of think that that's, well, you know my argument against it, so we shouldn't just keep arguing in circles. Well, I know. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, that's obviously we have to sell that with a premise, and for some arguments I'll accept your premise, and for some other arguments maybe you have to accept my premise, just to understand why my logic is as rigid as it is, because, yeah, I'm starting with different premises than you. So I obviously don't concede that there might be any of this so such thing as a respectable um, opinion. Okay, I just don't know if there is such a thing. You're either right or you're wrong. So all we're doing now is we're at a, we're at a courtroom and we're saying, what's the truth? Is the fucker guilty or not guilty? There is no in between. That's again, that's interlacing ontological realism with moral realism, because ethics are prescriptive, whereas reality is descriptive. Well, I'm saying that this is descriptive, okay? I'm just saying that we descriptively can go through with what exactly consciousness is. It's a phenomenon it manifests in these mammals. This is all descriptive. I'm saying this is part of the reality. Yes, of course, value isn't material. You can't, it doesn't leave a material trail. It doesn't leave vapor trails. It doesn't leave material trails. But it has a real component, just as real as matter in the sense that it exists as a description, just as our consciousness exists as a phenomenon. Yes, we are more than the material arrangement, I think quite obviously. If I froze us in time, right, at this millisecond, you could look at the matter and the matter wouldn't mean anything because it's not thinking. But yes, it's thinking through time, it's feeling through time, time is integral to our processing, uh, integral to our function, and I'm just saying I can't deny the existence of sentience. It may not be, it, it may be something that's phenomenological, okay, it happens as a phenomenon of material interaction. It is not made of matter, it happens because of the way the matter interacts, but it's a phenomenon like magnetism. I can't see magnetism, but merely indirectly, right? I can't see it directly, but I know it's there. Okay, so clearly you are not the least bit humbled by any sort of facts, values, perceived distinction that I'm going to somewhat argue for in a later section, but that's an aside for the moment. I want to ask you, you said that Justice is kind of a bogus concept. I think you were going off of the premise that, well, there's no built-in fairness mechanism, therefore any notion of justice is... There's no the undo button. Okay, but hang on, hang on, hang on. So, I'm going to give you a scenario. You're going to say it's a nitpicky scenario, but I don't give a shit. I'm going to give you one anyway. Okay, so there's a felon. It doesn't matter what felony he commits. It's a felon. He's going to get 20 years in prison. He successfully frames an innocent man. The innocent man is a Stoic, who is not really faced by the prospect of spending 20 years in prison. Now, if he could help it, yeah, he'd rather not spend 20 years in prison, but hey, going to prison for him is not going to be nearly as bad as going to prison for the actual individual who committed the crime, the guilty individual. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, the guilty individual. So the man who framed the innocent party, uh, he actually has, let's, let's say he's claustrophobic, or let's give him some sort of a condition to where we know he would have a horrible time in prison. Now let's also say that he will never commit another felony again, and he will actually never commit any other unproductive act again. The two individuals, regardless of who goes to prison or who stays out of the prison, the individual's impact on the world at large will be the same, right? So the only difference is, in terms of value metrics, is who goes to prison. The innocent one will suffer less in prison, the more guilty one will suffer more in prison, well not the more guilty one, the absolutely guilty one, the one who framed the innocent man, will suffer more. So in terms of just net impact, we have a difference, but in terms of guilt slash innocence, we have a difference too, right? So it's a polar opposite difference on with both goalposts. And that's why I thought my harm minimization, justice maximization, incongruities, I thought it was important to highlight that. And I don't think it was fair for you to say that that's more nitpickery. Well, I guess it's nitpickery from the point of view that I've made so many videos about these things, and it, this is, it gets a little bit complicated because you're getting into this social contract stuff and all this other kind of bullshit, but I'm just saying that I have sort of made it clear that 
I don't see any, you know, it's only a personal perception of value that I see in the justice of like a rapist knowing he sucks. Okay, I just have a certain satisfaction in the rapist, me, personally, emotionally. It feels satisfying that somehow you punch your fist into his face so he knows it sucks. The only, my point is, is my only, the only value I see in punishment ever, any kind of punishment, all right, is prevention. So but if you can't... But it's, about, but it's not just about deterrence because this scenario does implicate somebody who is innocent. The innocent man gets framed. So the, the deterrent point is not the argument I'm going off of. I'm basically saying this innocent man will be framed and will have to serve the sentence in place of the actual guilty party. So the fact that he will suffer less, in my view, should be a... That should take a back seat. And we should actually do everything we can to make sure that the actual guilty man goes to prison to spare the innocent man, even though the innocent man will suffer less. Yeah, well, I'm still going to argue that it just doesn't matter because we're all rats, and it's rat A, rat B, rat C, bat, rat. We can think we're better, we can think we're different, and yes, maybe we are. Maybe we're more productive, maybe we're all that stuff, but the very fact that there is no undo button, the very fact that there is inevitable buttons, okay, there are things that are going to happen, and even in your scenario, things will happen, all right? And they can either happen this way or they can happen that way. And what you think about it doesn't mean too much. It's just how you feel about it. So, I mean, if we could, you know, if we could have a catastrophic earthquake, right, and it happens someplace where no one knows it was a catastrophe, well, yeah, that's a lot better than one where there are people who know and then they get all upset. They say, oh, dear, we got to get some money and we got to do some stuff and all this crap. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like... You know, it's nice that you know, I have a you know I have a high regard for the truth and I have a high regard for all of that stuff. But all of that stuff is stoicish. It's very built out of some sort of person. You know, I mean, damn it, it's right, damn it. Well, right and wrong just doesn't matter. It's about the value here, and it's all about the value. And the game says it just doesn't matter what pawn falls off the board. I think that the it's right, damn it. I think that also ties into harm reduction as well. And I don't see how you can distinguish any of them. It's just a goalpost like any other goalpost. I mean, look at the fervor with which propertarians and Randians argue for the Earth's just right, damn it, their non-initiation of violence principle, or the Stefan Molyneux universally preferable behavior principle. They are incredulous when it comes to our axioms and our conclusions. And there's a reason for that because none of us reject any single specific fact. Stefan Molyneux does not reject a single fact, at least as it relates to the evolution of man, the origin of man, abiogenesis, none of that. Yet he manages to have a polar opposite contempt of the social contract or at least he has his own social contract, which he refuses to call the social contract, but it's still a social contract because it allows him to initiate violence against anyone who dares to cross an imaginary line in the sand he draws, which he calls private property, right? So so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying there is no absolute differential between the yearning to minimize harm and the yearning to maximize justice. It is notional, just as notional as his absolutist propertarianism is. Well, yeah, I know, but you weren't arguing. You were arguing that everything else is static. So I'm just saying that now you're going to count some peripheral um, harm or suffering that's created by these attitudes. So I'm just saying, okay, well, then that has to go into the calculation. So if you're saying that, you know, there's going to be this pawn, not only are there more sensitive people to the deprivation of prison, but now there's people more sensitive to whether or not we did justice in the end, or what we claim to be justice, and they're going to be upset because justice wasn't done. And so now we have to add their suffering into the boat. I'm just saying, in the end, I'm always going to go with the quanta math, and I'm always going to say that the quanta math really doesn't give a shit about what your perception is, it just gives a shit about whether you're in harm's way, or whether you're you know, it's trying to minimize the number of losses, the amount of time consciousnesses spend in this negative state, and the extremeness of the negative state. And I'm not saying these are these are easy calculations. I'm just saying that's where my calculations go. And seldom is it true that we 
that, that it is sort of psychological rubbish. So I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not denying your reality that in this world people need a sense of justice. They need to believe in it, okay? All I'm saying is, is that I'm saying it really doesn't mean anything. It's like being addicted to sports. And if you got rid of that notion, all that really matters, okay, is that you reduced, okay, harm. I'm going to have to go back to the fact that people who's, who don't have this concern about their own harm view your, what you just said in the same way that you view what they say about justice. At the end of the day, if they believe that it was all worth it, to them, your extreme concern looks just as out of whack as their extreme concern over justice looks to you. And I guess it's difficult to put yourself in their shoes, um, as, 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 but as long as we, if we are materialist, we understand that all of these things are notional, we can sort of understand why people draw different conclusions. All right, well, how do you, how do you argue to the fact that, let's say that I would argue that if there is no preventive value, there's no point in punishment? And so if you're not going to be deterring a crime, I would argue that you're just torturing the, the, you're just creating another victim. So it's just eye for an eye. And so instead of like, say somebody kill, rapes and kills my sister, although I personally want the guy to be tortured, I want him to be picked to pieces, I want him eaten by fucking ants, but I want that personally just because of emotional problems I have. Not for any logical reason, because I know it's not going to do this guy any good suffering he's going to endure is going to be just as bad as the suffering my sister endured so what the fuck have i gained by creating another suffering sentient well, being i've gained nothing no value whatsoever this 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 is in, in most cases yes there are a few extraneous examples i can't remember the name of the family but there was a post holocaust event i can't remember much of the details so i probably should not even bring it up but a guy had a chance to testify and to really lay down the law on one of the perpetrators. He chose not to do so, and whatever county held the perpetrator released him after one year. And the father, who had a chance to testify, spent the next 60 years in absolute crippling regret. Right, because he could have br he could have brought on the justice, but he chose not to. I'll, after after we get this call, I'll get the details of that case for you. But I thought it was a really interesting case where, even though on a deterrent level, right, there was there was no productivity to be gained because the person who was released after a year did not go on to do anything unproductive. But the individual who chose not to impose the tough justice spent. Once he found out that the this prisoner was released after a year, spent the rest of his life just in crippling regret for not having exercised justice. So, so I, I'll agree with you in most cases. Yes, the need for justice can be mitigated, and it really should be just about deterrence. But in a few cases, yeah, I'd I'd like to see assholes get what's coming to them just for the sake of it. Well, I'm just saying that I, I'm conceding that as an emotional fact. I'm just saying that that I'm not. I'm just saying that it, you know it is an emotional problem, okay, not 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 a logical issue. It's an emotional issue. So, would you discount emotional harm from net scaling, and would it just be physical harm? Because I place most emphasis on physical harm. Emotional harm, a lot of times, I'll exclude. I'll, I'll count it as trivial harm. Yeah, I don't count it as trivial. I just count it as easier prevented. So, I, you know, it's, there sort of has to be an excuse for it sometimes. So, so, like, you brought up one analogy where I was, like, saying, well, what if you had bargained for something previously? Or what if you had done it previously? You know what I'm saying? So, so like, in the, the example would be, um, you, you, you know, where you're using the torture example or something. You're being tortured by somebody. Well, what if you, in some previous circumstance had violated people's consent to commit some torture or something. You know what I mean? So like in, in a previous circumstance, you had almost consented to become a victim because you were a perpetrator. 
You, you know what I'm saying? You violated consent in some previous circumstance, indicating that now your consent can be violated by the masses or the majority's interest. Because when you were a majority, you violated a minority's interest. And so that gets to be a tricky question of justice, because now you're saying you've sort of consented to it because you've perpetrated the same crime. So if you're able to commit the same crime in a different context, maybe in a different context, but at the same level of violation, then why do you have right? Why you can't exercise a right you denied somebody else, I guess would be the argument, right? I, I don't recall me bringing it up. The only time I recall bringing up torture was when I railed against you saying that you would torture yours, you would step into the torture chair